Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 5D, where we're going to talk about the very valuable technique called a genome-wide association study. This is a technique that lets geneticists identify the genes that are responsible for the phenotypic differences that we're interested in. And it's this technique that has been responsible for providing the information that um, personal genomics companies such as 23andMe use to associate um, SNP differences with differences in health risks, for instance. A genome-wide association study uses analysis of SNPs to find places in the genome that are associated with, linked to, um, in some way causing differences in the phenotypic trait that we're interested in. And um, I'll remind you that a SNP is short for a single nucleotide polymorphism. And if you've forgotten sort of what SNPs are, how to think about allele frequencies in a population, you might want to go back and review Lecture 1O. That's Lecture O in Module 1 which will remind you of this, because this is going to be quite important a couple of slides from now. Now, the first step in carrying out a genome-wide association study is to find lots of people who differ for the trait that you're interested in. So you need, really, to do a good study, you need thousands of people and say you're interested in height, which is the first example you, we, we're going to use, you want to find thousands of people who are either noticeably short or noticeably tall for your study. The next step is you're going to isolate DNA from all these people um, and then use a, a little molecular kit called a DNA chip to identify which SNP alleles they have at each of a million different positions in their genome. So you're going to genotype them for a million SNP loci, specifying which alleles each person has. Some people will be homozygous, some people will be heterozygous. And then you're going to look through all of the SNPs that you've examined to find SNPs where the two populations, the short population and the tall population, have different allele frequencies. And those SNPs will mark places in the genome where genetic differences contribute to differences in height. So you might be thinking, wait, this is starting to sound really complicated. Why don't we just sequence everybody? Well, the reason is sequencing and the computer analysis that follows is still quite expensive, whereas um, a gene chip, a SNP chip, allows a million SNPs to be typed quite cheaply from a simple DNA sample. So it comes down to the money. So here's our example genome-wide association study. We found thousands of people who are either particularly short or particularly tall. And we've extracted DNA from them. And for each person, we've analyzed their genotype, the alleles that they have, at each of a million different SNP positions. And now, for each position that we've checked, we're going to calculate, for the population of short people, we're going to calculate the frequency of the two alleles at each SNP position. So, at allele position 1, we might find that about 60% of people have the A allele, and about 40% of people have the C allele. We're going to do the same thing for the population of tall people, typing each person to see which alleles they have. And again, we might find that at SNP position 1, 60% have A, 40% have C. And we're going to do this at every one of the SNP positions we've studied. So at position 2, again, we see that the short people and the tall people have the same allele frequencies. Same at position 3, same at position 5. But at position 4, bingo, we found a position where short people and tall people differ. The short people, about 90% of them have the C allele, 
whereas the tall people, only about 10% of them have C. 90% of the tall people have an A allele. This flags a position that could be contributing to the difference in height. This is an extreme case. So we do this for all million of our SNP positions, flagging using careful statistical analysis to decide how different do the frequencies have to be to count as different, flagging positions where the short people and the tall people have different allele frequencies. And then we take this data over the million SNPs over all 23 chromosomes, the whole genome, and we look for the places where the differences are strong enough that they're not likely to be due to just random fluctuations in sampling. So we see this, we visualize this most easily in the kind of diagram that's called a Manhattan plot. And what a Manhattan plot is, is along the bottom, along the x-axis, we're considering each chromosome. So this is chromosome 1, all the SNP positions on chromosome 1. This is all the SNP positions on chromosome 2, all the SNP positions, whoops, that should be green, all the SNP positions on chromosome 3, all the SNP positions on chromosome 4, all the way down to all the SNP positions on chromosome 21, and all the SNP positions on chromosome 22. This particular diagram, we've left off the X and Y chromosomes. And up on the Y axis, the position, each dot represents one SNP along the chromosome. So there's, hidden in this vector, there are a million different dots. And the height of the dot indicates how significant the difference between the tall people and the short people is. So this is where the complicated statistics comes in to decide how significant is the difference. So all of these dots down here on chromosome 1 are SNPs where the differences between the tall people and the short people in their SNP allele frequencies are very minor. Here are some dots where the significance, the differences are stronger. The same for chromosome 2, for chromosome 3. Here in chromosome 6, we see here's a cluster of SNP positions that are very significantly different between tall and short people. Here's another cluster on chromosome 8. And here on chromosome 19 is a cluster of SNP positions down near one end of chromosome 19, where the tall people and the short people have really different allele frequencies. So we would say this is a very strong candidate for a position in the genome where DNA sequence differences affect height. Now we can zoom in on this. It's hard to appreciate looking at the whole genome, how many SNPs different SNP positions we're looking at. So we can zoom in on a single chromosome. And I'm going to show you, we're going to zoom in on chromosome 21, which is one of the littlest chromosomes. And here is what we see when we just look along chromosome 21. Again, every dot is a SNP position. And you can see how many SNPs there are, even just on chromosome 21. And here, circled in red, are some SNPs where the statistical analysis says these differences are likely to be significant. And that suggests that they may be locations of a gene that's responsible for part of the difference in height, or whatever phenotypic property it is that we're studying. So. A genome-wide association study finds SNP positions. It doesn't necessarily find the genes, and it doesn't necessarily find the genetic sequence differences that are responsible for the phenotypic difference. Sometimes the SNP differences may be the actual responsible sequence differences that cause the phenotypic difference. But most of the time, the SNP differences 
are just close to the causal differences. Just by chance, the SNP chip doesn't include the causal differences. So there's still a lot of research needs to be done to pin down what are the sequence differences that cause the phenotypic difference. Now, here's a question for you. What if the heritability for the trait was lower? So in our example, we were using height, which is very heritable. But if we'd been working with a trait whose heritability was lower, how would that have affected the ability of our genome-wide association study to find the genes that were responsible for the differences in height? And the answers are that if heritability had been lower, the genome-wide association study is likely to have found fewer genes and the effects that it's found are likely to be weaker. And that's because the genetic causes of the differences between our two populations have been kind of diluted by environmental effects and chance effects that have also contributed to the phenotypic differences we're studying. So what we've done, we've talked about how you can use genome-wide association studies of SNPs to find the loci that affect a phenotype. We're finding places in the genome, locations on the chromosome, where sequence differences affect the phenotype. We're not necessarily finding the causal sequence differences. We're just finding the place where we would look for the causal sequence differences. Now, coming up next, we're going to go back to thinking about the results of genome-wide association studies for genes that cause differences in height, and we're going to encounter a very interesting, perplexing problem called the missing heritability mystery. I hope to see you there.